Hello. Uh, so we will com complete our discussion on ray tracing today. Uh, and that will be done over this set of slides. So let's share that now. Uh, again, I am Yusuf Sahiloğlu and I borrowed these slides from my colleague Oz. Uh, so last week, we have seen some action regarding ray tracing. And that action is about computation of the primary rays uh, and then intersection of these rays with the scene objects. These two components are handled already last week. Uh, essentially, the primary rays are the ones that are generated from camera towards the scene. And as they go to the scene, they intersect some, they go through a pixel. And that pixel color is decided based on the intersection of that ray with the scene object. Uh, yeah, so we covered this stuff. Uh, and actually, I can even give the pseudocode of what we have done last week. For each pixel in our image plane, we compute this ray R uh, generated from the eye location, camera location, uh, towards S. Um, yeah, so this S is actually the 3D uh, location of the pixel. Uh, in our image plane. So although I go to this uh, location using integer coordinates, a double loop, nested loop. So this is maybe the pixel uh, 25 to 53. Uh, then we compute its S coordinate, the 3D coordinates corresponding to that uh, indices, to those indices 25, 53. We learned how to do that. Uh, and then we generate our ray R. Then for each object in the scene, <clears throat> we test whether R intersects with <clears throat> the current object O. And if it does, then we uh, we actually we also keep the closest intersection point to the camera because we assume that all the uh, objects are non-transparent opaque, uh, hence they don't allow the ray go further. So we will get the closest intersection point with this T min parameter. Uh, and then that intersected object uh, comes below. If there is no intersection at all, then I go to this place where I just put the background color for that uh, pixel. But if there is an intersection, then I just put the uh, base color of this object to that pixel location. And if I do that, unfortunately, I will end up with this very uh, unsatisfactory image because I just put the base color. So I have a green ball. So I just put that green everywhere flat, which is not realistic because I haven't considered light uh, at all. So I need to do better. And this week we will do that improvements. This image looks bad because we don't use a realistic shading algorithm. We just copy paste it everywhere. The color, exact color of the uh, intersected objects, but it should be varying, right? As we know from, from real world. Uh, so, as you start to consider lights around you, then you will get more realistic images. So even this one is not very satisfactory because the color doesn't vary through the polygon piece. Okay, so this is called flat shading. So we will do even better than this, but even at this form, it is this uh, light illumination makes this output better than the uh, just base color copy paste tactic. Uh, okay, so now let's do those improvements step by step. Uh, so each object has a fixed 
color and we just use that color everywhere, which is not realistic as discussed before. Actually, each object has this reflectance distribution. So it has a different way of reflect light. So we also need to consider light because each light is also different from uh, another light. So we need to consider all these things as we do our shading, as we do our coloring. Uh, and here is another related observation. Same object can appear different under different lights. So we will uh, import these ideas to our rendering, uh, ray tracing based rendering. A model that is uh, very accurate is actually a spectral method that is based on wavelength distributions. Uh, so you can look at their outputs here on these links, uh, but uh, I will go through a simpler model. And you will also use this in your assignment, RGB model. And it is already a, a good model. So there are multiple productions using this model, like Toy Story movie, etc. Uh, so this is still a very good approximation. So it considers reflectance of an object. So how much red light a given object reflects. Zero means no reflection at all, and one means it completely reflects all the red light it uh, receives. Similarly for the other channels, green and blue. And power also is uh, different. Every color is different than another color. So we also, uh, every color has this uh, power of red component, green component, and blue component. So a light source, is the place where our light comes, obviously, as the name implies. Uh, so this is <clears throat> going to be a point light source. We will consider it that way. <clears throat> that way, it will be easy to define the uh, vector towards the light source. <clears throat> and the color of lights, you can use any color, but it is typically white, one, one, one. Uh, and an important observation here is, so consider a scene where the light is hitting. So actually in my background, the sunlight is hitting somewhere in this wall. But I also see other places like my monitor behind me. Although there is not direct light attack to that monitor, I can still see it because it receives lights. Uh, because uh, lights bounce Bounces ar bounce around, given a given light bounces around from wall to another wall, from there to another place. And so it, it, there is a very complex mechanism because the light really bounces from everywhere. And in, in the end, it illuminates the whole room. <clears throat> uh, and we can't really simulate all those uh, bouncing rays. It is just infeasible. So we make this approximation, which is fairly nice, by the way. It is called ambient light. All these background lights it seem to be constant. OK, so I have this constant term that that is added to the color of each object. Hence, it will give, uh, it will prevent zero colors, like black colors everywhere. So let me start my shading computation with that term, ambient term. So the ambient reflectance coefficient of an object is typically the diffusion reflectance coefficient of an object. So it is typically the color of the object. Uh, so we take it that way, although you can use anything here. And there is also this uh, intensity of all the bouncing lights around you. Uh, yeah, so this is not just particular light coming from your light source. This is again simulating all those bouncing lights, and I simulate it with a constant light, which is typically white, one, one, one. So the contribution of ambient term is can be observed here. 
uh, without the ambient light, so obviously you can understand that the light is coming from this diagonal direction, illuminating here. And the places where no direct light vectors arrive, they are just plain, plain black. But if I add the ambient term, then those black pixels, they just get lighter because here uh, the object itself is gray, so not a very, uh, uh, not a very uh, attention color, uh, but still uh, you can see that uh, we have some improvements even uh, in the parts where there is no light, direct light. So that is that ambient term. We will, uh, and in the end, I will just add all these terms together. So it will be even more clear when I wrap the things up, but let's understand that there is this ambient term, which is composed of the capability of ambient reflectance of your object. And it is also uh, based on the ambient light intensity, which is a constant intensity. So here is a different term called the diffusion term because uh, once the light, now I am not talking about ambient light, those bounces, I am talking about the particular light uh, starting from my light source, hitting the surface. Uh, and so it will, uh, so the light here, as I'm rendering, as I'm computing the color of this particular point, this light will be used uh, with the normal of this uh, point, and it will uh, it will be used to get the color diffused from this object uh, in all directions. So. Again, remember my task is to learn the color value of this point as I will transfer this value to the corresponding pixel in my image plane. Uh, to do that, I need this light vector, a vector, so how that is pointing from the point X towards light source. And also I have this N, the normal of that surface point. Notice that uh, if the light is right on top of this point, so it has this full, full illumination, it directly attacks that point with full force. So it will, you will then reflect all the color completely, 100%. Uh, but as I move this light to a location that is almost perpendicular to N, then it will just pass through. So it will make a very light, very, uh, very less uh, reflectance of your object color. Okay, so I can capture that information using this cosine term. So what is happening here? Again, let's make it look like our ambient discussion, ambient reflectance coefficient versus the global ambient light here. I don't have that ambient light. I have a particular light intensity, which is based on this WI incoming light direction. Uh, and also I have this diffuse reflectance coefficient. So this diffuse color of the object that is waiting to be reflected. So because in the end I will see this color in my pixel. So I will I can reflect this fully, if theta is zero, then cosine zero is one, as you know. So KD is fully reflected in combination with the uh, light, color of the light. Uh, again, it is typically one, one, one. So this really doesn't make an additional effect, but it can be any uh, light color. Yeah, so then you may wonder why do we use cosine? theta here uh, and again you can observe it as follows if the light is 
fully aligned with my normal, then this theta becomes zero. So light per unit area will be one, maybe the biggest uh, value is one, assume that. As I rotate this plane, or similarly, as I rotate my light source, then the same amount of light is now illuminating a larger area. So light per unit area decreases because light is fixed, but the area uh, it is uh, attacking is larger. So I can capture that using this cosine term. There is also a little trick. Uh, I don't actually use this cosine theta uh, in my implementation. I use zero or that cosine theta. Zero because, so if the cosine theta is negative, then it means that light is somewhere here. So let's understand this better. So first of all, how do I get the angle between two vectors, W and N? And again, assume all of these are normal, normalized vectors, unit vectors. So then uh, I can do W dot N is equal to length of W times length of N, which are one, times cosine of angle between them, which is cosine of theta. So there is this prime here, but I just use theta. Uh, okay, so this is essentially geometric meaning is the projection of this W onto this vector N, and I will, that product gives me the length of that projection which is a positive entity, if uh, W and N are looking at the uh, at uh, compatible directions. But if the light source is here in the back of this plane, then my W, I naturally changes to this guy. So sorry about that, this should have been here. And, uh, and then the same tactic, the projection of this W onto N, will project like this, and I will use this length of projection. And notice that this is now towards the back of N. So the length of this projection will be negative, which uh, warns me, which uh, is a clue that the light is at the back of my scene. Uh, so it's, uh, I shouldn't consider negative values. I, I should just ignore that uh, diffuse term because the light really doesn't help me. So this part is like z uh, zero. Uh, so it will get no contribution from that light uh, if it is in the backside of the plane. So we can actually see that here. So in this case, I am talking about the uh, vertex axis somewhere here, uh, light and the normal direction. So here is the normal direction and maybe light is here. So what is happening is, this is the uh, WI and this is the N. So when I project this, I will have, I will make the projection to the back side of N. So it will be negative value. So I will get zero contribution for these pixels, as you can see here. With the, thanks to ambient light, I can get more colors like non-black stuff is happening here, but this is about ambient light. Okay. And I can also make a little uh, bit of update to this diffusion term, diffuse term by playing with this part. So KD cos theta is fixed. And this here is the light intensity I was talking about. It is also, I don't, I don't just use it as is. I use some proportion of that light intensity because if the light is very far away from me, then it is like it doesn't exist. So uh, to capture that, this is the distance of light to that X. So it is the distance between this point and this point, and it is called R. I just scale the intensity of light with the uh, re reciprocal of that uh, distance squared. 
and then I end up with this uh, diffuse shading here. I see only the diffuse term. So you can call this diffuse shading as well. Okay, so illumination so far, let's uh, see the same thing from the point of view of uh, the program maybe. So here it is more discrete. I will try to summar summarize things so far. So let this be the base color of your object. Okay, like it was gray for this thing. Uh, or one uh, red, if it is one, if it is red, then I will have CR equal to one and CG and CV are all zero. Uh, illumination at point X, so this is that point X, although I didn't write, but this is the X point where my laser uh, shows. Uh, so I, it, it, it is about how much base color is reflected, okay? how much base color is reflected. Uh, so the base color, so first of all, if the base color doesn't have any green in it, then I don't care this, this part because it doesn't have any green to reflect uh, in the first place. So intensity of green will be just none. But if I have some red reflectance capability, then, uh, that non-zero value will be scaled by the ambient term as well as the diffusion term. And the diffusion term uh, depends on the light as well as the normal of X at that point. So I, I don't just use uh, the diffusion reflectance coefficient. So again, let's connect this to the previous slides. So the KD here, the fused reflectance coefficient, is I call it diff R. Uh, so this is actually the color, uh, and I use uh, a factor of it based on the normal and light vector. Uh, and this is the ambient reflectance coefficient we have discussed before. Uh, so there may be like you can use these values, which is typical. Uh, yeah. So now let's add another term called specular term. Uh, so far we have ambient term and diffusion term. Now let's also talk about highlights, the, specul the diffusion in a specular direction, uh, specularly. Uh, where does the uh, reflectance occur? So I will talk about the specu uh, specular light. So what uh, I am talking about here is this highlight, the uh, white part. So I can get that into my output as well using uh, light, normal. And this time I also need uh, my location. So I will also the camera's location, the eye location. Because if the camera is somewhere here, then the light, we assume a smooth surface, so it will be reflected using normal vector with the same angle as it comes. So N is the bisector of this green region. So if the eye is here, then I will receive all the reflection, so it will like hurt my eye. It is like the mirror light is hitting the mirror and you are at that unlucky location and you see all the reflection and you will see everything white. So uh, this is called primary, uh, the, the light reflects through all directions, uh, but it will, the most dominant reflection will be in this, direction R, and I will just consider that direction for simplicity. So if this angle between I and R, which I call A, angle A, if it is zero, it means that my camera is moved here, right? So it is here. So then I will receive all the reflection, all the specular light, all the highlights. 
if you are off the reflection vector, like here, or even you can move it here, so you are very off, then you don't really see that highlight. You get lesser reflection. So in the end, it depends on this angle, just like the diffusion term. And I will use the cosine of it actually, which is obtained by the dot product between these normal uh, unit vectors, E dot R, used with the angle between E and R. Uh, and the actually gives me the cosine of the angle between E and R. And there is one little trick we use, which is this velocinous coefficient or exponent P. So it is done because of that. So I generally want my highlight to die off suddenly. So I don't want a smooth distribution of this highlight over the whole surface. With a regular cosine, I have that smooth distribution. But as I uh, exponent, as I take powers of cosine, like second power or a bigger power, then I have this effect. So the value, dies off quickly, fade out, fades out quickly. Okay, so that's why we have this dot product, the cosine of this angle A, and I also used a power of it, P power of it. There is an alternative model, by the way. So the first one here is due to a guy named Funk. That's why we call this Funk material model. And this is due to another guy called Blin. Uh, and here, what Blin does is, instead of computing that R ray explicitly, and later in this class, I will also compute that for you. Uh, so it will have multiple operations. The Blin model is more efficient because what it does is, it just makes an average between E and L. So it just takes the half vector between E and L, which is H, okay? Then it looks at this angle between H, half vector and normal. Again, if this is zero, so if I move the camera towards here, remember this is our primary reflection direction, then this also follows, right? So H also moves and it comes here. In which case, B becomes zero. So this, when B is zero, it means that your eye gets the whole reflection. So B equal to zero is equal to A equal to zero in this case. But there is no direct linear relationship between B and A. Uh, so that's why it gives a different value, a different illumination uh, for you. And if you go with the, Boolean model, this model, then all you need to do, you need is the uh, angle between n and h vectors, and you will use n dot h, which gives you the angle, cosine of the angle between n and h vectors. And again, I do the same glossiness trick. Uh, I want this to fade out quickly. So now let's again wrap things up in the form of something you can implement. Uh, so this part is already done. Uh, I have already told you how much the base color is reflected using ambient and diffusion terms. Now let's also add how much uh, the light is reflected. Okay, so this is the color of light. This is the color of object. Uh, so there is this uh, specular reflection coefficient uh, based on your material, whatever it is. And this is not based on material. This is based on the current configuration of your X uh, given by your primary ray. And, and at this X, I have this normal N uh, and I, I compute my H half vector uh, and I take the power of it. So this is the overall, we call this the Blin model. 
uh, again, instead of n times h, I could have used e times r, then I would have Fong model. So what have I used so far in my code? Uh, I need, for each object, how many parameters you need to specify. I need to specify the color of the object, obviously. Uh, and then the diffusion reflectance coefficient, again, material-based. Specular reflection coefficient, again, material-based. And also I need this uh, glossiness term for the fade out. Uh, and ambient light is not a parameter, it is fixed constant. It is simulating all these bounce, bouncing offs, bounces of the light. And light color again is fixed, it doesn't change uh, based on your current object or anything. So uh, our color model uh, to color our object includes then the base color of that object which is this, and then how much that base color is reflected using ambient and diffusion terms, and how object reflects light specularly in some direction, like in half vector direction or in R direction. So how much object reflects light specularly, which is also known as the highlight term, specular term. <clears throat> and this term deals with the light color. Yeah, so this is a good approximation uh, of uh, coloring in real world. And it's a good digital approximation, uh, especially this ambient part is amazing. So you don't really do all the like bounces. Uh, you don't take them into account. Uh, and if you look in the entertainment business, we see that Toy Story objects are colored in this with this model. So this is already uh, giving you good results. Like in this case here, this guy has some specular reflection right around the nose, uh, and also the shading diffusion is proper based on your light direction and normals. So this is a acceptable and very quick, uh, fast to compute model. And you can play with this model even more to get cool effects. Like consider uh, a ball or a balloon in orange color. It is very smooth. Uh, and if you slightly change the normals, like perturb them, this N term here, as well as here, that N effects here. So in the end, you can get this uh, orange, the fruit effect. As we know, it is not that smooth, so you can get the get that effect, which is called bump mapping. Uh, but you can get this with this framework instantly. Or instead of using uh, a fixed color through the whole vertex that we called base color, you can get the color from a texture, from a JPEG image then based on your current point x you will be getting a different color crcgcb and you will be getting it from a from an image uh, yeah uh, you can uh, play with the light vector like moving the light around it will automatically change the reflections for you. Uh, and you can also play with the way you, your specular highlights work using parameter P. Okay, so that specular term, I, when I add it here, you will see this effect, which makes things more realistic. Obviously, if your object is rubber, like a squash ball, then you will not be seeing this. In that, in that case, specular, Reflectance, co reflectance coefficient will be zero anyway. So all those half vectors, those uh, computations will not even be done. But mostly we don't have rubbers 
like we don't have squash balls everywhere. Uh, so we we have to support this specular highlight as well in case we need it. And now let me demonstrate you the behavior of P. Remember our cosine plots here that is very primitive, but it gives some idea. Sorry about my drawing here. Uh, so a regular cosine function, as we know from calculus, it's, uh, it is very smooth. It os oscillates, but I don't care about the oscillation here, but it's uh, as the angle theta uh, gets bigger, cosine gets smaller. Uh, at a slow speed. So as the angle gets bigger, then cosine becomes smaller at a high speed here, if I use a power of cosine. So that's why here at a low speed versus at a high speed. So cosine dies out quickly here. So after here, we have a cutoff and we uh, come back to the original color. I, I don't have any highlight effect somewhere here, which is mostly what we expect. Uh, but here, I have that specular highlight distributed overall, which is not very good actually. So here, I am using P equal to one. And here, maybe P equal to 10, maybe P equal to hundreds here or thousand. Yeah, so it increases. Uh, okay, so this is, so far I have talked about, uh, I have focused on a point X and I have given you the discrete, discretization of the rendering equation actually. So there is this topic uh, of, uh, so actually the rendering equation is a more powerful tool. Uh, it essentially, so the idea is, uh, so far I have used only one light source, okay? And based on that, I get the color on X. With rendering equation, I can get many light source into picture. Uh, and so I will do the computations for each light source separately. So, and I will add those uh, colors to the final color of X. Okay, so rendering equation lets me do that. And what I mean is the following. Uh, so there is this ambient light that is that has nothing to do with the current light sources as we discussed, so it is outside. But here, this is the tricky part. So far, I haven't used this integral. I just assume there is only one incoming light. So there is no dV, dW. Uh, and that was it. Now, this omega represents the hemisphere around my point X. Hemisphere, like half sphere, because again, if I is here and light is here, then I will get some illumination here. But if light is somewhere below this plane, then that light will not be illuminating X at all because it is backside. So it will not be reaching X. Uh, so that's why we consider only the hemisphere here. And over this sphere, I consider all the WIs, all the incomings. Uh, it is too costly to evaluate. For each service point X, we need to integrate over the entire hemisphere surrounding X. Uh, and for the simplification, uh, what we do is we exclude all the directions. So by the way, so let me be clear, for, uh, more clear. So this hemisphere tactic, it is for the bounce, bouncing of the lights, right? So it bounces off from everywhere. So we can't really simulate that because of the computational power, computational load. What we do is, is for, for this continuous integral, we replace it with a discrete sum over each light source. And then what happens to the all bouncing offs? They are just used here 
in my ambient term. So exclude all directions except the light sources in my hemisphere. So don't use a continuous integral, just make a summation over each light source and then add an ambient term to simulate what was excluded. So, so far we have done that actually, except I haven't used multiple light sources. So in this set of slides, uh, I will, yeah, I will just add this actually, it is the new part that moves me closer to the actual rendering equation, which covers multiple lights. So what we have here is for each light from one to L number of lights, I do this uh, color reflection. Again, it will be a composition of diffusion and uh, uh, specular terms. Uh, diffusion and specular terms, we combine them. Uh, and there is also this ambient light, ambient term, simulating the bounces, uh, the jumps of light from everywhere, every surface. Uh, so actually, so let's let's make it more clear. So notice that this L output A ambient, it is actually outside. It doesn't depend on the on your light sources. What depends on the light sources is the diffusion term as well as the specular term. So I put these LD and LS stuff inside this sum, which is a discrete sum over light sources, not an integral not a continuous integral, another simplification. Uh, yeah, so that is the rendering equation actually. Uh, and it supports multiple lights. In this picture, I can tell you that I have two lights around because of one, two specular reflections. Yeah, uh, so let's continue further. Uh, so we have been talking about this diffusion term diffuse term and the specular term, and they need it, they require this normal computation, which is essentially a, a vector that is perpendicular to the surface at point X. So what you can do to calculate this is in general, so here for a sphere, it is even more clear, but this is not the general case. So let me just quickly handle this. Uh, so sphere is defined by its origin center uh, and radius r, all the points that are of distance ready r to center s. So take a point p then, so I want to find the normal at p. Then what you do is, uh, I am talking about the vector from C to P, okay? C to P, this vector, which is my normal vector already. Uh, and uh, I can scale that, normalize that with the length of this vector from C to P, then I will have a unit normal vector. And, but this is not something we will do actually uh, because we need to be generic. So given a plane or a triangle, because our shapes are made of triangles. So I want to compute the normal at this point. Okay, A. I can use these two vectors from A to B and A to C. Then I can do the cross product, which works using the right hand rule. So make your fingers point in this a to B direction, then bend it, bend them towards A to C direction. Then your thumb sticks out of the screen. That would be your normal direction, which is a vector perpendicular to A to B and A to C vectors. And you also normalize it further to get your uh, normal unit vector. Yeah, so it is uh, the general, the generic way of calculating normals. Uh, 
And now, so far, let's uh, put things together in the form of our pseudo code. Uh, for each pixel s, I calculate the uh, primary ray r. Then for each object in the scene, if the ray r intersects O at point x, then I take the closest intersection, closest to the camera. And then if there is no intersection at all, then I just use the background color, no problem. But if there is an intersection, now I will use this uh, color, the reflected color, not the flat constant object color, but the reflected color based on the uh, normal at X, based on the light direction and based on the camera view direction. Yeah, so this is the current uh, framework. Now I will add even further uh, realistic things to this framework. So shadow is one wonderful thing that makes uh, the scene very realistic because shadows are everywhere. Again, in my background, I can even see some shadows, like the shadow of my monitor in the wall, but anyway. So with the ray tracing framework, I can add shadows instantly. What is the idea? The idea is very cool, actually. Normally, I send rays from camera to X, then calculate some color at X and map it back to the pixel uh, through that ray. In this case, I will send ray from X to the light source or to the light sources, if, if there are many light sources. If X cannot reach the light source without any intersection, then it means that X must be under shadow. Again, if X cannot reach to the light source, then light doesn't reach X either. Uh, hence, there will be no uh, light on X, uh, which, will, which will make it make its color uh, zero. Actually, there is ambient light, so that's why it won't be zero probably, but it will not be reflecting the uh, actual color of itself, as well as there won't be any uh, specular highlights because of the lack of light here. Yeah, so that is that. By the way, I call this ray shadow ray. Some sources just call it secondary ray, but uh, there are also other secondary rays that we will see in a second. But let's stick with this slide. So shadow ray is this ray from X to light source, again from X towards light. And uh, since this is a ray, I can parameter, I can parameterize it using one parameter T time. So intersect ST with all the objects in the scene. If there is no inter, again, you can use our previous week discussion for the intersections. If there is no intersection before the light source, then the point is not in shadow because it can reach the light, hence the light can reach it, uh, vice versa. Otherwise, if there's an intersection, it is in shadow. There is little, there's a little trick. So due to precision errors, uh, this X, the ideal location of X is right on the plane, but floating point numbers, the precisions, it can actually be slightly off, like it can be slightly under the plane. Then when I do the ray, shadow ray, it will be intersecting the plane itself. And it will tell that, okay, this there is an intersection, so X must be under shadow which is false because actually that is the location of X. So there, there is no intersection at that location. There may be multiple self intersections, by the way, like if you have a human being like, or another thing. So if the light is coming from here, light, so the arm puts shadow on this kidney region. 
So the shadow ray here is intersecting the object itself, but not at a very close location, at a far away location, like on the arm. So this is shadow. I am not talking about that kind of self-intersection. I am talking about the, so is this point under shadow? So it may be intersecting with itself because of the precision errors. So the solution is, I just start my ray a little bit early using this epsilon amount. So now let's see how I can easily plug this shadow ray into my uh, into my ray tracing algorithm. So so far these are uh, compute ray for each object. Make an intersection test. If there is no intersection, again, do not think pixel color is just the background color. If there is an intersection, by the way, pixel color can also be some color from texture. But anyway, so let's call that a background color. If there is an intersection, so I need the pixel color, okay, for the current pixel S. Uh, so start with some color, which is the ambient color we have talked about, like representing all the bouncing of colors. So the color is not zero to begin with. There is definitely be a color, but color is also additive. So I can add diffusion and specular terms to that color. Uh, but here, since I am also considering shadow here, I will also do this additional loop, compute the shadow ray from the current X uh, to L, the current light. Uh, so if the shadow ray intersects the object, before the light source, then continue the light loop. So don't add the upcoming diffuse and specular terms because those terms need light and apparently I can't get any light. So continue means that just come back and do it for a different light for the next light. Maybe that next light will have no in shadow ray intersection. So I will get diffused and specular terms from that light, but not the previous light. Okay, so again, color is additive. I just add them up. I don't blend them like I don't take any average. I just add them up. Which gives me these cool uh, shadows, increasing the reality even further. Okay, so see, uh, remember our very first unfortunate uh, picture so if i can make some uh, uh, yeah, yeah just look at here no diffuse colors no specular highlights no ambient colors no shadows and once you jump to slide 40 something after all those additions we have this cool output now uh, with the shadows. And notice that shadows are can be touching to other objects, also to the floor. So it is uh, naturally computed. And I will also talk about the reflection rays now, in addition to the uh, shadow rays, uh, which will make ray tracing recursive and even more powerful. Uh, so the idea is the uh, color of object two contributes to the color of the current object one. If object one is reflective, like assume that object one is a mirror, then you will have some color on object one, but that mirror also reflects the color of another object, right? As it's a mirror. It, it doesn't have to be a perfect mirror, but it will, as long as it is reflective, it will get some portion, some spirit of object two or even object three or four. So it depends on your level of recursion. So to determine, determine the color at object two, check its shadow ray. So, okay. Uh, so let, let's 
look at object one. So I am talking about the color here, okay? I have ambient term. I have diffusion term based on normal and light. I have specular reflection based on normal light and I, wherever I it is, uh, camera is. And now additionally, I will also follow this reflection ray, just like in our funk uh, material model. And this reflection ray hits here to a totally irrelevant object. But as long as object one is reflective, it will get some portion of this color and it will also import it here, pulls it back here, okay? But what about the color of object two? Again, object two may have a weird color based on the, its own shadow ray or object two may be reflective as well. So it may be getting the color from additional colors from wherever this reflection ray hits. Maybe it is also object one or another object tree, or both of them. So this is how the recursive tracing works. Okay, so uh, again, our algorithm at a different formats for a given IJ pixel, I learned the 3D camera view space coordinates of that IJ using our previous week class. So I have this ray in the end, I have this intersection in the end, and then I compute this color uh, and map it back to IJ, image IJ. Yes, so, uh, uh, so true reflection effect is possible via ray tracing, just as I have discussed. So let me show it with a different figure here. For shiny mirror-like reflective surfaces, I assume that sphere is like that. Generate a new ray in the reflection direction. Okay, so that would be the black ray here for the current uh, ray. Uh, whatever this ray hits, which is the green thing here, uh, is what is reflected in the surface. So can be factor in the rays final color to this color. Uh, by the way, as far as the shadowing goes, I can also use this yellow shadow ray. So this picture also summarizes that. And I can also talk about more rays, like in under the category of secondary ray, we have already seen uh, shadow ray and reflection ray. Now there is also this refraction ray. What is that? It is the red ray here. Glossy objects, they let the light propagate within themselves. themselves. Okay, so the light can go through them, can travel within the object by means of refraction. So when your ray comes here, it can erase the black reflection ray, the yellow shadow ray. I can also depending on my realism need, I can, and also depending on the object, like if it's a glossy object, it can let the light come in. So then I have this refraction ray. Again, the refraction angle depends on physics. Uh, again, it will be a trigonometric uh, value. And this ray, wherever it hits, there will be a different color here, right? Based on some reflectivity here, Maybe this portion is reflective, so it will get color from here based on the shadow here and diffuse color here. So some part of it will be pulled back here as to my final color of this pixel or this point X. And again, since this is a ref ref refraction ray, it's, it can also go out just as it has come in. So you will also be copying the color from here all the way back to our initial point X. Now I can give you the reflection ray that we have talked about, the black ray here. And also before driving that, which will be WR here. Okay, so ray reflect. Uh, I can also, remind you that this reflection ray, I have also used this way back in our 
material model discussion, right? In the specular light discussion, remember the R here. Okay, this is exactly, so I haven't shown you how to co compute this. Now it is time. I have shown you a trick like avoid the computation of R, the reflection of light. I have used the half vector between I and L, which is okay, by the way. Uh, but you can also use R itself, which would be the reflection ray here. So let's see how to compute that. So given the light coming in this direction D, I need to compute R this. So I want to start from here. I want to... Uh, come here actually, right? So then I, so I, I am here. I, I need, sorry, I need this vector R. So how can I get that vector? Let's think about it. First of all, uh, I can uh, talk about, so this is N by the way, I will reflect D over N. So N is also given, uh, but N is unit vector. Okay, so, but I have started here, so it may be short for me, so I may need to enlarge it, or similarly, I may need to shrink it, but in general, we will be enlarging it. So how can I do that? The, uh, the dot product of D and N, what does that give to me? It gives the following, it is the projection of D on n, but that will be a negative value, right? Because n is looking to the left and I am now at the right-hand side here. So I need a minus to get a positive scalar. And with that positive value, I will scale this vector, which will move it like extended here in this example. Now I can, what if I add d and this scaled n, then I will be at this point, D plus that scaled N. I will be at this point. Then I can add one, of, one more to that to get the copy of this, which will land me here. That's why I have this final output, D plus two of these scaled uh, normal directions. Uh, okay, so with that, we are almost done. Uh, so what I am seeing here, LM, what is M? So, okay, so this is the reflection, due to reflection rays. I can also add that term here. Again, so let's also, this assumes only one light source. That's why there is no summation of light sources. Even if there is a summation of light sources, I could, I would, uh, leave this ambient term out and I will keep D, S and M terms inside the sum. Uh, but currently there is only one light source, so I will have diffusion term, ambient term, specular term and the mirror term. And for the mirror term, there is no end to make the reflections. I need to stop it, stop the recursion at some level, like uh, keep the number of bounces to four or three. With that, here, so what is reflective here? Here, the floor is supposed to be reflective, okay? That's why the floor points are getting colors based on the reflection rays, wherever it hits, apparently it is hitting to the gray, uh, green sphere. So I can also have these reflections in my life now. Yeah, so as you can see, there is no stopping to ray tracing, actually. actually. Uh, yeah, so there is a stopping, obviously. But, uh, so I can, even in this introduction to computer graphics class, I have made uh, nice improvements already. But you can go further, like about timing. So you can make a partitioning of your domain. You can make a special, special partitioning using KD trees or bounding volume hierarchy to 
make ray tracing fast for the object intersections, ray object intersections. We have talked about point lights to easily define the rays to the light, light vectors. You could have talked about area-based lights. Refraction, I have talked about it, but I didn't really show how to compute those reflection rays. So it is a big business, physics-based business. Uh, just like you have added shadows, you can also add additional effects like smoke and fog. Uh, essentially, you will be blending the current pixel color with uh, fog colors uh, if necessary. Uh, and as far as the acceleration goes, ray tracing can be done in parallel. It is very natural because every pixel is uh on its own uh, so on gpu there is already a lot of software based ray tracers so software implementations but these days we also see hardware GPU, hardware specific for ray tracing in gpu so research on that area is also ongoing and for ray tracing, actually, I can also show you a totally different application. Like so far, we have already, we have all dealt with uh, computing colors to put to our pixels. Okay, so it's a very basic job if you look at the high level picture. I can use ray tracing for picking. So, what is picking? I want to click uh, on a pixel in a 3D graphics environment and then drag my mouse which will rotate that object, right? Uh, like it is called trackball navigation. Uh, so when, when my 2D mouse clicks, uh, I need to calculate, I need to learn now the 3D point because I will 3D vertex of the mesh in the screen because I will maybe use that vertex as my handle to my deformation algorithm and I will let that displace based on the displacement of the mouse. So long story short, when the user clicks the mouse on a pixel in a 3D graphics program, the program needs to determine which object uh, point corresponds to that pixel, which is the task of this uh, ray generation and ray object intersection. So I just use the first parts of the ray, trace, ray tracing algorithm, like the parts we have discussed in the previous week. Uh, so there is no coloring here, obviously. So this week's class has nothing to do with this picking action. But I want to show you that ray tracing can be used for a totally different activity. And let's finish with cool pictures, like some ray traced images here. We are talking about reflective uh, objects. Uh, yeah, and some shadows. A physically based ray tracer. Uh, or another physically based one. And here I can see refractions. Output with refractions. These are glossy, uh, glossy objects. And the ray, the light propagates within the object. Uh, hence, since light is inside the object, I can now have colors to those locations. For instance, here it gets, it is also reflective. So it's getting the color from this close object and so on. Uh, another realistic output. Uh, yeah, and uh, so this is uh, where I make a quick comparison with the ray tracing pipeline and the forward pipeline, the rasterization based pipeline. In the rasterization pipeline that we will see later in this class, the 3D models are projected to the image uh, plane. Okay. Uh, and then the cuts on the vertices are interpolated somehow. Uh, in the ray tracing model, the opposite happens. The 
rays are sent to the scene and the colors are pulled back. So the reason I talked about that is for the uh, forward pipeline, like take the flood shading, for instance, you have this triangle in 3D and I have information on three vertices, the vertex colors. I will use one of these colors to color all the inside of this object, which essentially sucks because it gives, as you can see here, one color per polygon. Like everything here is light blue, which is not smooth. You can make it smooth using Gora shading because in this case, you make a linear interpolation of the three available colors, first along edges, and then from edges, from one edge to another edge, do a second linear interpolation. And we call this bilinear interpolation. So you can know the inside colors, which interpolates the four colors on the polygon, giving you a better thing. But you can't get the specular reflections, okay? Because why assume that this is a big triangle, big polygon. I have the same color on the A, a forward shading algorithm. So what we do with this model is uh, instead of interpolating colors directly, I interpolate the normals at these three vertices, which gives me a new normal at a given inside uh, point and it has a corresponding 2D pixel point. So it is a heavy computation. For this pixel, you will recalculate the color here. Like we have done with ray tracing using lights, etc. Uh, and then you will use that color. So funk shading is a good replacement for uh, ray tracing. So it gives more or less similar outputs. Uh, and it is faster because you don't really generate any rays. However, still for realism, ray tracing is unbeatable uh, because you can't do any shadows, for instance, with this form tactic. You can't do reflections, right? Refractions, etc. So ray tracing is the real standard to get static, uh, realistic, uh, cool images. And with that, I stop uh, and I uh, complete the ray tracing business. Uh, and now you are ready to complete your first programming assignment. Uh, okay, have a good day.